Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming out here to see this and paying some attention in a very busy world. So I'm here to tell you that you're all cyborgs. Um, could you hold up your phones really quickly? <laughs> all right. Well, the faster you held them up, the more cyborg you are. <laughs> um, but we're all cyborgs, really. It's, it's, it's not that you need implants to be it. It's, it's that we're come to a point in, in human history where any time you look at something, um, any time you interface with something through your eyes or through your hands, um, you are in a human-machine symbiosis. Um, and the traditional definition of a cyborg is from a 1960 paper on space travel, which is an organism to which exogenous components have been added so that they can adapt to new environments. Basically, um, a guy in a spacesuit is the perfect form of a cyborg. Humans aren't supposed to go into space. They're not supposed to climb Mount Everest. They're not supposed to go in the water and scuba dive. They're not supposed to do all of these things naturally, but they create all of these external objects so that they can evolve into a new creature anytime they want, swim like the fish in the sea, go into space where no creatures are even present, really, um, and, and they're very strange uh, people. I kind of think of, of people as crustaceans. You know, they, they have clothing that they buy and they have to shed out of it, and then every new season they have a new shell that they have to buy, hopefully, if you, if you have the, the funds to do it. Some people don't. But when you look at the history of tools, uh, the hammer was basically an extension of the fist, and for many years it's exactly the same. Um, the big issue with the hammer is that this is pretty much exactly the same size and shape as it will ever be. It's a stable object. It's a physical extension of itself. Um, but when you look at a phone, it's completely different. It's this mental extension. And so it doesn't have a defined size and shape. It always is morphing and changing, and really it's just becoming smaller and smaller. Um, now devices are, are larger on the inside than they are on the outside, which is a very strange thing. that We basically have Mary Poppins bags um, with us wherever we go. So the shape of this tells, it, it tells you exactly what it does. But the shape of this phone and this computer says nothing about what it does. It's just a computational machine. So a traditional anthropologist generally goes to another country, another field site, and looks at people as others and categorizes them as, as very curious people doing very curious things. Look at the kinship relations. Look at the interesting tools. Look at all the interesting food they eat. And then they write it up in a paper, and not a lot of people read it, unless you're Margaret Mead, and then everybody reads it. Um, and in general, it's, it's all about looking and examining this other. But I think it's really important now that we've become sufficiently cyborg-like to look at ourselves um, as, uh, as cyborgs and, and, and look at you know, what's sitting across from us at the dinner table um, because that's where the new real field site is. These curious people uh, that carry things in their pocket that cry and you have to pick them up and soothe them back to sleep um, that you have to plug into it, the, the wall at night because they get hungry. There are all these curious things that are going on around us and we don't really look at it as a field site. So my job as a cyborg anthropologist is to kind of look inward and say what is really going on um, you know, generationally things are changing much faster than they were before. How is that affecting us? How is that affecting how we think? So one of, one of the things that we now have access to is this kind of idea of amb ambient intimacy, where it's not that you're always connected to everybody at any time, but that you can always connect to someone at, at a time. And the other thing is now we're storing all these memories inside these devices in our pockets or inside computers. And when you want to access them, then you have to remember, you know, what, what, was that, what was that term that I used to describe that photo that was taken in 2007, and then you go and find it, versus bringing it up within your own mind and remembering that memory. Um, so when, whenever you use your email account, now everybody becomes this kind of persistent paleontologist where the field site is your email account and there's all this new dirt that's being layered on on top of it all the time and you have to keep digging through it. You have better and better search tools over time. Uh, but it's a bit tedious, you know. People don't really like being paleontologists, but they have to be paleontologists. Every day they need to find that paper or that report or the thing that they need to sign or that document like that W9 form, pesky W9 forms. So Nick Rodriguez um, is this very interesting uh, industrial designer, and he made this uh, installation where every time he got an email, this virtual grass would grow. So you actually watch this grass, this, this, this email garden, as he called it, grow with the, the amount of email that he got, and it would spill out into the, into the art, uh, art exhibit floor. 
Um, but when all of these things come together, you get this kind of panic, right? It's, it's not only do you have email coming in at all sides, but you have something else from your regular environment, plus you have your phone, and it never stops. Now, I feel like when I answer an email, it's like, the, it's like the brooms in Fantasia. You try to cut one in half, you get three more brooms. And I really don't know what to do, so every once in a while I just stop checking my email, and then people learn that I don't respond for two weeks. I apologize to the conference organizers. <laughs> So there are, there are some, some discontents um, to this prosthetic culture. Uh, first off, if you keep a device for too long, it turns against you. It makes you look embarrassing. Um, it dates you. Uh, it's like keeping an old Pinto around. Um, you have to evolve to the next level of, of external prosthetic device. And if you look at car ads, you know, the car ads are like, sleek, amazing car. It's uh, beautiful, and it's like black and shiny, you know? And now you look at phones, it's like, sleek, amazing smartphone. It's shiny, you know? It's, it, because really, it's just a vehicle for your brain, right? So we have the same ads that are going on for cars as for brains. And, and there are a lot of... Um, there are a lot of examples of you know, people getting onto buses with old phones and feeling really embarrassed and the girls are laughing at them and they're like, I don't know, I have to evolve and upgrade. Um, the other issue is that everyone has these, these kind of ears that you can press a button and hear something on the other side of the world. You can connect to all these people. But because everyone has these amazing superpowers because of, of technology, it's not really a, a big deal until your phone breaks and then suddenly you're no longer a superhuman surrounded by a society of superhumans that can hear all the way across the world. So this was, uh, this was one proposed solution to the problem of, of temporary negotiated private space. I, I basically think like uh, using, you know, using a cell phone in a restaurant is like having a peeing section in a swimming pool. It's, you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for the crude analogy, but you already ate and it's late at night, so I think I can use it. Um, but the issue behind it is that when the landline telephone first came out, everyone thought that people just sit in their rooms and become very schizophrenic. You know, you're just talking into nothingness, and, and how can that be? And everyone's just going to lock themselves away. And that didn't happen. It was mostly, hey, you want to come over for lunch? Sure. Um, and it was allowing people to meet with each other in person. And now that these, these cell phones exist, they're no longer um, attached to a cord in a room. And now you have to find temporary private space wherever you go so that you, don't, so that you have this kind of barrier of, of audio around you. And so they're becoming like the new cigarettes. You know, you have to walk outside to use them. And if you're standing at a bus stop and you don't have anything to do, lo and behold, you know, you'll use the, the phone because, God forbid, you actually are doing nothing, right? Um, so I, I worry about, you know, the, the time for reflection. At least you could reflect with a cigarette, right? Um, but with the phone, you're just trying to, you know, look at a YouTube video of cats so that you can pacify your brain because it doesn't want to wait, you know, it doesn't want to stop, it doesn't want to have nothing to do. So I was okay with all of this. I thought, okay, I grew up in this very technologically uh, connected generation, I'm fine, I can answer email faster than everyone, I can have lots of data, uh, and I thought it was, you know, I thought it was just peachy keen uh, until this happened. Um, if you look at this, this is my ankle, um, this one. Uh, I broke all the bones in it and got cyborg implants. Uh, so that's all the junk in my ankle, basically. And the, I basically couldn't do anything anymore. I couldn't use a computer. Um, I, the only thing I could do is kind of lay in bed and read comics. Uh, the painkillers were really intense. I was in a wheelchair for like six months. I just lost a year of my life, basically. But in reality, it was the best thing that ever happened to me um, because I had to stop. Um, so I needed to sleep. Um, tons, and I, I didn't really remember a time that I had slept a lot except for when I was a little kid here, um, where I was just, you know, playing around, and, you know, as a kid, you, you're kind of this utopic, like, king or queen. You know, you have servants, basically. They, they make food for you. They drive you around in cars. They, they give you clothing. They dress you in the morning, even, because you can't really put on socks at that age. And, and uh, so you have all this time to think. And when I was four, I was really excited to be a little kid because I had infinite time, you know. Uh, and, and after a while, you know, that kind of went away. But um, for a period of time, I was thinking so much and my dad was reading me this book called The Evolution of Consciousness um, <laughs> as a bedtime story. <laughs> that, that I really couldn't get to sleep. <laughs> so I had insomnia at age four. And uh, it was a really 
big issue. Uh, I, my parents would say, well, you have to go to bed at 8. But they didn't tell me that. They had this uh, automated lamp that would turn on at 8 p.m. And then they'd just point to the lamp and I would go to my room and sit there until midnight thinking because my dad had just read me this great bedtime story about how memories are weighted and they weigh down the sections of your brain and then you have these amazing things that stick out from your memory and that's how you remember important events when you're when a significant amount of time has passed and i just sat there thinking about how does my brain store memories and and how and how am i ever going to get my brain to turn off so i can go to sleep this is ridiculous um so i started devising different methods um and I, I basically was thinking about you know, shutting down the brain because my dad had this, this early computer and I would watch him program it and then after he was done, he would shut it down. He would close all the programs and then he would go to the shut down button and shut down the computer. I said, hmm, I wonder if I can shut down my brain the same way. So I said, well, what are the processes that are running in my brain? Well, I've got eyesight, I've got hearing, I've got the sense that I'm standing upright um, I have, you know, the sense of touch, the sense of smell. Um, I'll just start trying to shut them down. <laughs> so I sat there uh, for a really long period of time trying to figure out how to isolate the processes in my brain and shut them down one by one until all of them were gone and I could slip into slumber at about midnight. And then, you know, of course I tried to do this faster and faster so I could get some sleep. Um, and so I just lay there very still and I would focus on turning off my vision. And when you turn off your vision, it kind of looks like a screen going blank and like the ants racing across it. As you go deeper and deeper into nothingness, then there's darker and darker ants on the screen. I've never really talked to people about this, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, your hearing goes off. And, and, and what it sounds like when that turns off is, you know, if you were playing music, it starts to get really chunky and weird and your brain just stops processing it and then, there's, then you don't hear anything. And after a while, you know, your, your sense, the scary thing is when your sense of being upright goes off, then you feel like you've dropped like three feet. So, ah! So if I could get past that and all the other things shutting off, then I would go into this wonderful state of basically consciousness, but everything was shut off and I'd start to hallucinate, which was really REM sleep, right? I was going into a dream state, I was completely conscious, and then I could hang out and like play around. And, uh, and the unfortunate thing was that I'd still be, I still felt like myself was awake. So then I'd watch these crazy dreams rolling by. And I was just wondering, like, what the heck is wrong with me? Like, why do I have to go to sleep like this? Like, why can't I just close my eyes and go to sleep? Um, and so, you know, I got this, I tried to learn, you know, I don't even know what this process is, but from watching my dad's um, computer shut down. And he was also reading me this other book, which was all about computers operating and being shaped in the, in the shape of human brains, right? You've got this external brain, and it works very similarly. Um, so sometimes it failed. Um, my earliest dreams, or I don't even know what to call them, were I, I would sit there, and suddenly I was part of everything, and it was this nice, smooth plane, and then it got really chaotic, and I was bound into this plane that I couldn't get out of, and I would remember would just cry and my mom would have to like walk with me around the block until I, the feeling wore off. And I was too scared to let that feeling go on for a really long period of time. So I stopped that and I wish I could have, you know, when you're a little kid, your brain is so elastic, you can just do whatever you want with it. And now I'm, you know, now I can't do any of these things anymore, which is sad. So then, uh, then my dad showed me uh, disk defragmentation says, sometimes on a Windows computer, you run lots of programs and memory gets stored not next to each other. Little parts of files and little parts of software get stored over here on the hard drive and then that makes your computer slow because your computer says, okay, I'm gonna run Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word partition one is over here, 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 and then you're sitting there waiting for a minute for the thing to load up because it's all stored in random bits of the memory on the hard drive. And so I thought about that, I said, hmm, so how do you fix this? My dad said, well, you just run this program called Disk Defragmenter. And I watched this program all day long. It was gorgeous. <laughs> you could see the bytes in the computer reorganizing themselves and putting themselves sequentially next to each other. Oh my gosh. And every once in a while, it would do this great compression where it just go, vroom, and you'd be like, wow, Microsoft Word is now fully complete. Ah. <laughs> Really, I didn't go out and play, I would just stay there in the summer and my parents were really concerned about me. <laughs> so here's an example of what this looks like. Um, 
This is, uh, it, so the blue is where it's completed and the green is where it's working on and then you can see there's holes in the system. And so what's gonna do is find all the different files at the bottom and place them next to each other at the top and eventually, instead of having this giant sheet of lots of holes and fragments, you get this nice, concise, consolidated hard drive and your computer hums like a hummingbird and it's a fantastic moment. Um, <laughs> So I thought of what happens with people, right? You run a lot of different programs when you go through everyday life. You run the program of, you know, now watching a YouTube video of a cat most of the time. Um, but but uh, mostly, you know, you're, you're learning things. You're writing memory, like, like in school. It's, it's very structured. You wake up, you go to school, it's 8.30 a.m., you learn English, and you store that to your brain. And then you learn chemistry, and then you store that to your brain. And you store it in these sequentially and, and perfect formatted moments. And if it's done right, you get this beautiful, clean write of the English language to your operating system and mathematics to your operating system. And you can easily do all of these things because it doesn't take very much time to grab those memories from your brain. But if you sit there in class and you're writing a note to somebody else or not paying attention to the teacher, you have note writing interjected within English. And then, you know, you have a fragmented hard drive and a fragmented memory recall system. So I, I thought of this as, you know, as I started to go on the web and I started to get very fragmented in ADD and how I experienced life, I thought of all of this information junk food that, that I was consuming. Um, and, and I was perfectly focused as a kid up until I seriously got on the internet and then I started to kind of just consume everything. And I realized that my brain was just getting horrendously fragmented and I didn't know what to do about it. I got slower, I got slightly depressed, I could not write uh, long, you know, giant task texts. I couldn't write books anymore. I was really obsessed with doing lots of very intently focused tasks. And it, it was very upsetting because unlike your stomach, which tells you when you're full and says, stop eating, uh, your brain doesn't really tell you when it's full. It doesn't say, hey, stop putting memory in. I mean, it, it, it mostly says, well, I'm really tired, but it's very addicting. And so I realized a lot of the times that I was just eating a lot of information junk food. So that's, that was my brain today. I, this, is, this is my... <laughs> this is my image of what I feel my brain looks like right now, um, which is quite upsetting to me. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, after a while, I became the Skinnerian rat. If you've heard the story of B.F. Skinner, he had this rat in his laboratory. Every four hours, he gave it food if it pressed a lever. So sure enough, the rat would go to press the lever, get the food. Then he said, what if I give the food to the rat randomly, and the rat would just press the lever all day long so it could get the food? So what, uh, email comes in randomly, you know, interesting news bits on the web come in randomly, and I just sat there clicking the button, getting my email, clicking on a news site, becoming completely addicted, and storing all of these different random memories to my brain again and again and again. And then I would do that till two in the morning, and I couldn't sleep. And because I couldn't sleep, I couldn't defragment my brain, because sleep allows you to run the disk defragmenter on your brain, compress all the memories, and store them. Um, which is why often people have really weird dreams. But that's, this is my hypothesis, don't take it. Take this with a grain of salt. Um, so I, I missed out on the self-reflection because instead of choosing self-reflection and trying to you know, store these memories and do some kind of manual defragmentation, I was just clicking, 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 clicking. It, was, it still is a very depressing <laughs> part of my life. Um, so I, I basically lost this ability to mentally defragment and I started to find it, you know, what are other ways that I can do this? So I thought of dreams as this mental defragmentation. Um, so an example, um, I went to a lot of different schools, uh, about 12 different schools, and they all had different buildings. And when I went to sleep at night, I had this dream of a combination school where all the different schools were like compressed together in one building. And that's when I realized that my brain was just compressing the memory of school into one sector on my brain as the same building to save space. And I thought, wow, that's a very clever. <laughs> I need to sleep more. <laughs> and then I can... So then I had this friend, uh, Kyle Drake, and he had um, this friend called Derek Zumbach. And he was hooking people up to um, EEG machines and monitoring their brains. And he had this thing called, he was trying to detect alpha wave synchrony where all the processes in your brain are, are kind of uh, synced up. And so I said, okay, I'll fly out to Minnesota and I'll just try that because I needed to get away from the office for a weekend. And so I got hooked up to this EEG machine with all this very sticky conductive gel. Um, and, 
And this is, this is the little monitor that this guy got from this, this other guy in Venezuela. I mean, this, this is just his crazy experiment, right? Um, and then I just sat there and I tried to remember how I tried to put myself to sleep when I was little and, um, and tried all these different brain techniques that, that I used to use when I was little. And lo and behold, this is, this is the number of little alpha wave synchrony moments that I had. Um, and there's a little graph up there, it's almost impossible to see, but it basically is random chaos from different parts of your brain, and then they all sync up all at once, and they're all moving at the same time. And if you can keep that, um, then it, it feels really good afterwards. Um, and my whole intent was to feel like I did as a kid, where, you know, when you're a kid, you can run anywhere, you don't have headaches, you're just completely aware of everything, always recording stuff to your brain. And I really missed having that feeling. Um, and so what he did with this is, is whenever your brain would align up like that, he would have these giant speakers play this really beautiful, melodious tone. And it would go, ooh, and he'd be like, oh, that's the best tone ever. So I learned to like keep putting my brain into this wonderful state because of this great melodious tone that I heard. And over time, I just kept piling on these little alpha wave synchrony moments. And then after about um, 90 minutes, I got out of the room and got all the weird sticky conductive gel stuff off of my hair. And I felt for the first time since being a kid that I actually was fully aware of the world around me. And it was this like wonderful moment where I almost cried. It was just so great um, because I had just felt like I had finally defragmented my brain just a little bit. Um, and in a world where you're just completely sucked into this information junk food, where your brain doesn't feel like it's working correctly all the time, it was a wonderful moment. So that's, there's no way to see this, but I'll upload the slides to SlideShare um, later. So I, I kind of looked in, into this movement, the quantified self movement, where it's, you're taking something that was formerly invisible and making it completely visible, and then seeing it over time and watching the trends. And it's this cybernetic feedback loop where you're able to, to increase that behavior over time and, and, and really kind of defragment your life or debug your life. Um, my, my friend John Lipkowski had this great quote. He says, you know, there's all these social networks out there and all these new apps, um, but there's so many apps that let me know each other, but there aren't many apps that let me know myself. And that's the one great frontier that I don't know. And I loved that quote because it, it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, we know a lot about each other, kind of, or at least about how we present each other, but our brains are still uh, comparatively uh, unknown, and with all the reflection that we have on other people's stuff and other people's news stories and other people's Facebook walls, we don't have enough reflection on the self anymore. So um, I'm going to go through some examples of funny things that I've done, um, very brief examples. So one day, my mom got me this game called The Sims, and I ran this little simulation of people in it, and I said, hmm, I can do some interesting stuff with this. Um, so I modeled my apartment, and um, and my roommate into the game, and uh, gave, each, gave me and him personalities uh, that, were, that were similar uh, to, to what we had in real life. And then I ran the game in 3x speed, so really, really fast, and I saw these trends of behavior happen over time. For the most part, we were both very happy, just like real life. But there was this stupid chair that was in the way, and that was decreasing our happiness over time. This little happiness meter would like go down, I'd be able to watch it. It's like, hmm. I wonder if I move that chair, if the overall happiness of these little characters in this game going at fast motion will significantly increase. So I went in the game and I clicked on the chair and I moved it over just to somewhere else and I ran the game really fast again and lo and behold it got happier. There's all these great bars of happiness and joy. I said, hmm. So I went to my apartment and I moved the chair to the same place I had in the game and I noticed overall that my happiness had increased. <laughs> And I thought, hmm, this is interesting, because the, the guy who created The Sims, uh, Will Wright, created the game because he had a devastating fire in his house. And he thought that it would be very therapeutic to be able to model houses and do things in them and, and, and have the whole experience of it um, um, again and again. And so he created this, this game, The Sims, which is now wildly popular. Um, so I, I kept making these again and again, because one thing is, when you are in your own life, you can't see it at fast speed. You just see this slow-moving, real-time thing. But if you speed it up, or you take some data over time, you can see all these trends and you can debug your life, like moving a physical chair over to the side and becoming happier because it was in your way and you argued with your partner about it all the time. 
It's just, you know, you don't notice it. You just feel this mild dystopia about your life, but you can't really put your finger on it because you can't speed up time and see what's wrong. So I thought that was a, a curious way to do things. I, I wouldn't put all your money on this at all either. I, this is just a fun thing to do. This was, this was a side project. Um, and then I participated in this thing called the Harvard Happiness Project. It was this series of extremely long, it would send you an SMS three times a day and have you fill out this really long survey. Where are you? Um, are you happy? What are you doing? Who are you with? Are you at work? Or are you at home? And then you would fill all of it out. Um, and I think it took three months, three times a day. It was really tedious, actually, and I hated doing it. Um, but in the end, I got these nice graphs. Um, where it said, you know, your happiness on a Saturday and a Tuesday. Um, you are happy at a pub with a bunch of programmers. Um, <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, drawing on a whiteboard, preparing food. Um, you are happiest when you want to do something that um, versus, yeah, want to and have to. Anyway, there, there were all these correlations that showed up. And I thought, this is, this is very interesting because one of the correlations was I always told people I loved my job. I always said, I love this job. I was, I was working as a UX designer at a, at, a, at a software company. So I love my job, it's great. I love it, I love it, love it. But whenever I was here taking this Harvard happiness test, I reported feeling depressed at work and feeling horrible. And then I looked at the results and I said, well, I should probably get a new job. I should probably just quit. Because I'm just telling people what they want to hear, but I'm not actually happy. And so I quit my job and, and worked on this startup that I'm working on, and I was immeasurably happier. Well, actually, very measurably happier, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the trend with all of this was making what was formerly invisible visible. And I thought, what power that is to, to be able to take these invisible things and make them visible and, and, and see these trends. Um, uh, my partner, who I started uh, Geoloki with, he had been tracking his location at five second intervals for the past three and a half years um, <laughs> with a little GPS device in his pocket. And he made these incredible looking maps of everywhere he was, color coded by time of day and speed. So here is a slightly hard to see map of Portland. Um, if you look, you know, there's a, there's a highway that looks like this big blue line where he was um, going rather, uh, going rather, um, this was actually like, so, so the blue is him uh, three years ago. And when I looked at this map when I first met him, I said, you know, you drive all the time, don't you? He said, yeah, I do. I was like, do you like driving? Are you happy when you drive? And he's like, no. Do you carpool people? Yeah. Where do you work? Oh, I work over here. It's really far away. Well, why don't you move closer into town so that you get two and a half hours back in your life every single day? He's like, hmm. He said, if you correlated your emotion and your mood with that commute time, you would find out that you could cut all the unhappiness out of your life by just cutting your commute and moving into town. So um, in the next section, the yellow, that's this year, he moved in inner Portland, and now that's his entire drive time and commute. And you can see him up, uh, up on, on the left side, driving around looking for parking. Um, going <laughs> <laughs> Something we didn't plan for. Um, <laughs> So then he got a bike and he doesn't have that anymore. Um, but with all of this data, he was able to like go through his life and kind of debug it. And now he has, uh, I think we calculated, what is it, like 500 more hours a year in his life that he can do things that he wants to do. And he's a lot happier. Um, so, uh, so then the other thing that I was thinking about is, is kind of approaching the idea of awareness with technology. Um, a lot of technology really sucks. You have to look at it all the time instead of it benefiting you, which is not the promise of technology. The promise of technology is not about having 20 remotes. It's about having something do something for you because you need it done, but not doing the wrong choice and not having you look at all the technology all the time. Um, so I looked at kids being completely and totally aware. You go to a park and there's like 10 kids and they're like, hey, let's play the game, here's the rule, let's go. And they all run off and they play this invisible game that doesn't exist and they get lots of exercise and they have no idea and they're really strong. They can like go on the monkey bars for hours, right? Hum humans, but adults cannot do that. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to take, I wanted to take technology and, and try to make a kid's game, right? Um, and one of the games that I got the chance to play was this game called Pac Manhattan, which is you take the entire grid of New York, or, or actually just Manhattan, um, and you turn it into a Pac-Man game board. 
and you use your phone to tell the remote control station where you are in real time. I'm at the corner of Everett and Davis. I'm at the corner of 16th and 17th. And, um, and then they tell you where the Pac-Man is and you have to go and find him in real life. And I thought that was an incredible game. And when we played it, I felt completely attached to reality. Usually when you go into a city, you just go to the places that you're supposed to go. Oh, I'm going to the store. Oh, I have to find parking. It's not, oh, I'm walking down the street that I've never been down before because it's very interesting. That's only what you do if you're on a vacation. And a lot of people don't even know their own city and don't go down any of the streets. But with Pac Manhattan, everyone was running around at like three mile intervals trying to find all these dots that were completely invisible. And we all felt like kids because here's the rules of the game it's completely invisible, it doesn't exist. And we were all exhausted afterwards and we had lots of exercise and we didn't notice it. And I thought, this is exactly what it feels like to be a kid. And if we all do this, it would be great. Health insurance premiums wouldn't be as high. Um, and, and we feel a lot healthier and happier. So this is an example of, of calm technology. Uh, there's a guy uh, named Mark Weiser from Park Research. In the 70s, he came up with this concept called calm technology, literally calm. That technology rests in the background and appears only when you need it and then goes away. And I loved this concept because it wasn't technologies in your face and, and you have to deal with all these little control panels and menu items. It's, it's there when you need it and not when you don't. It's invisible. I love this concept. And I said, I want to build technology that is smart in the background and helps you instead of hinders your life. So um, one, I didn't make this, but one of, one of the examples that I really liked was Mika Satomi's massage uh, game controller. Uh, basically, you wear this vest and somebody presses the buttons on your back and plays a video game and you get a massage at the same time. <laughs> because a lot of people, I mean, they like getting massages, but people don't like giving them as much. So if you play a video game while you're giving somebody a massage, then, you know, three hours later, somebody has a great massage back and you won the game and it's fantastic. <laughs> and the better you are at the game, you know, the better the massage the person gets. So that's good incentives. Um, so, so the idea is that, you know, you are the button and your actions create a button. Um, so instead of having a physical button that you press, it's this invisible area and when you walk into it, something happens. When I get home, I, my house knows I'm home, the lights are automatically turn on because I have this little GPS circle around the house. The house talks to my phone and says, lights, turn on. I never have to fumble for the light switch, I just, it goes. And I, that's not practical for everybody, but it's an interesting example of this calm technology where you've removed an action, um, except you have to manually turn it off if you want to do a surprise party, um, because then the person knows that, uh, <laughs> that <they're>, anyway. <laughs> Um, another one that I liked, you know, a lot of people are doing this thing where it's all visual, it's all, you know, augmented reality and this and that, and I really like the idea of non-visual stimulus. Like, this is haptics. It, it's basically this belt that buzzes when you're, when you're facing north. Um, and this guy in Germany created it, and he realized that he always knew where north was. Um, and even in his dreams, he would feel the buzzing around his belt as he rode his bike in his dreams. <laughs> That's which direction was north. And he found that he inherently knew his way back to places. He, he always knew which way was west. I mean, it was just this amazing thing that he started to experience. And, and I think he wore it only for about six weeks. Um, but the idea behind this is if you were driving in a car and you didn't have to look at the directions on the map, but you just felt them, like two buzzes to your right if you need to take a right, two buzzes to your left if you need to take a left, um, and, it's, and it's programmed in, you have all of that available space to interact with reality, to talk with some. It, it takes that, that um, fundamental uh, sense and compresses it down into this little small space that, that opens up your mind a bit more. So sixth sense type of technology. So, so then I, as a tribute to Pac Manhattan, um, I made this game uh, with, my, uh, uh, with my startup company called, um, called uh, Map Attack, which is basically the exact same thing as, as Pac Manhattan, except you can see the little dots on the grid, the GPS fences, and when you run through your phone buzzes and you get points. And there are two teams, and so whoever gets, the point, gets to the point first, it turns red or blue, depending on what team you're on. And we debuted it at Stanford University. And this is the Stanford campus. It's actually massive. I mean, it was basically the same. It's basically this campus. Um, it's enormous, and it's really hard to get everywhere. Um, and everybody wanted to walk around it. Everyone said, oh, I really want to walk around this campus. But everyone just sat inside and checked their email. So I said, let's go outside and play this game. And, uh, and three hours later, everyone had really toured, oops, 
had really toured every single part of the campus, and they were out of breath, and they were running around, and they're like, I got 50 points, it's fantastic. Um, and I had never been to Stanford before, and I made this map on a Google map, just very virtually, um, and I made this 50-pointer, uh, and, and it was something that just didn't get captured the entire game. I was watching the map, I was watching people move around in real time, capturing these points and getting really excited, and this one 50-pointer just never got captured. And about an hour later, this guy comes back, and I see the 50 points has been captured. And he said, you put the 50-pointer in a construction site. And I said, did you go in the construction site to get to 50 points? He said, no, no, no. I walked up to the fence, and I, and I said hello to one of the construction workers. And I said, can you just take my phone and hold it? <laughs> <laughs> Until I get the 50 points. And the construction worker said, okay, I'll take your phone. And he uh, held it. He said, oh, I got 50 points. This is great. What the heck are you doing? And, um, and the guy said, well, we're playing this game called Map Attack. And you run around, and you get points, and it's great, and I'm really out of breath, and this is fantastic. And the construction worker said, you know, the entire 20 years I've worked here, no student has ever talked to me. Ever. No one has come up to me, because everybody who just walks around campus with their nose in their iPhones, or on their iPods, or iPads, or, you know, Walkmans in the past, and it, and it would... No one was interacting. I was just a different person to everybody. And you're the first person to actually come up and talk to me, and they had like a, a half an hour worth of discussion, and that's why you got back so late. So, that was interesting, because it brought people together. It was a piece of calm technology that made people into kids and allowed them to interact with people that they wouldn't have before. And somebody saw, I think, Larry or Sergey of Google, and they're like, I should get 1,000 points for that. Um, but we didn't, have a, we didn't have a line item in the database for that. So, um, to conclude, I really think that the best technology is invisible and that it should get out of the way and allow people to connect with each other a little bit more. That, you know, the robots do the good job of being robots and the humans are good at being humans and you need to amplify both of those systems um, in order to have something nice and symbiotic. Because we've been tool-using creatures since the beginning of time. That's how we've evolved. Um, so we need to still be symbiotic, and I don't believe computers will take over anything. I think that the computers with the best interfaces that allow us to be calm and relaxed and enjoy our lives will win out over time now that they're accessible to everybody. At least that's my hope. The thing is, you know, you don't want to use something that's really annoying, um, even if you have to. Um, but if you have a choice in the future between something that's very well designed and makes you feel relaxed, you'll choose that. And because you usually buy technology, you'll choose it with money. And so the evolution will occur that way. So no longer this. This is, uh, this is a guy at, at MIT in the 1980s who's wearing 80 pounds of computer equipment because he was very angry that you had, to contort, you had to contort your body to a computer. He said, a computer should be wearable, and you should be able to wear it, and it should conform to your life, and it should help you out. And he made this, this heads-up display that would detect advertising, cancel it out, and allow him to get text messages on it because he said, why should I walk around and see other people's messages? I should be able to see my own messages. Um, and now he has a very tiny heads-up display that does very similar things, like reminds him of the people walking down the street that he met like two years ago and things like that. That's a whole other talk that I usually give. So, But 80 pounds of equipment, so no longer this, um, but this. These are, <laughs> these are some, uh, some, some of our testers from App Attack that just got 50 points in one of the hidden alleyways that I put the 50-pointer in, and they were very excited. So. Um, with that, that's uh, hopefully a strange overview of how I approach reality um, and <laughs> how I taught myself successfully and then unsuccessfully how to think about reality and meditate and then also some future of technology. Um, so thank you very much. Three questions? Okay, cool. Three questions? If anyone's interested. If not, I'll all be around here, hopefully finding some food or something. <clears throat> Just can't pass up the opportunity to ask, what did you learn about insomnia? What and, did I learn about insomnia? Yeah, and, what, and, and, and cures thereof. I learned that insomnia puts your brain into a completely different way of thinking and that it's really useful in small doses. Um, I have insomnia again, which is good, but it's, it's where I think of the most thoughts. Um, it's kind of like either you go to sleep really early and you wake up at 4 a.m. and there's no one around, or you end up you know, staying up really late and you think differently because there's no one else around and you're forced to deal with your own thoughts, which a lot of people don't get to do as much anymore. 
So you reframed insomnia as a from a problem to a kind of an opportunity? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Or else I'd be really depressed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm interested in um, how you got rid of the bad dreams. Ooh. Um, I started closing my eyes instead of keeping them open when I tried to turn off everything. Um, if I kept my eyes open and there was a bedspread in front of me, it would turn into this physical plane that I would get entwined with and then it would get really complicated. Um, and I said, well, if I turn off my visual stimulus first, then I won't have that happen. Um, and every once in a while, like, I'd be able to sit there like, very still and have that sort of feeling wash over me um, if I focused really hard. Um, and I really wanted to explore it, but it was just so scary um, when I was little that I just stopped. Um, and the other thing is just running around, like moving as much as possible, because if I sit too much, I become everything, and that was really scary to me. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's how I, I... I'm really sad that I didn't just sit with that and see where it took me, because that would have been really interesting to explore. And if anyone knows anything about what the heck that is, please tell me, because this is, the, <laughs> this is probably the only audience that would understand what the heck, what the heck I was getting myself into. Thanks. Um, thanks for your talk, uh, and I love the uh, optimistic last note about where technology is going to go. And, um, I guess the question that I had around that is, um, where do you think um, that we need to be doing anything to help kids not develop an adversarial relationship with technology, um, you know, the kind that gets our brains fragmented and diverts our attention? And if so, what do you think is, is best for that? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so when I grew up with technology, there was less content on the web than you could create, as in you actively created the web when you were on it, because there wasn't much there. You had to participate. You had to hand code a website. You had to hand code a piece of content. You had to hand digitize something. The entire web is made by hand. It's painstakingly created, and even the bots that, that run Google are painstakingly created and maintenance. I mean, it's this, it's this superhuman endeavor, handmade tirelessly. You know, but, but the thing is now there's more content on the web than there is to create. And, uh, well, I mean, there is, the issue is that the content that's there is e more easily accessible than it is to create the content. And so that's the thing that's really upsetting. I mean, I, I've, I've lived in houses just because it's interesting to me with, you know, with kids who I've just watched grow up and they just sit in front of YouTube and they just watch YouTube videos all day. And to some extent, that's the new collective consciousness. That's new, like, little singularity moment. You know, it's like, Michael Jackson dies, everyone knows that at the exact same time now. You know, there's an earthquake in Haiti, everyone knows that. They're little micro-singularities, they're little micro-narratives that everybody experiences. Um, but the big issue is that it's easier now to consume than it is to create. And if people don't learn the joy of creating, um, then they'll never get up the brain stamina to do so. Because the rewards of creating are very different and in some sense more long-term than they are of consumption, which is just a quick hit, you know, your quick dopamine hit in your brain. And it's really easy to get addicted. And I am having a really hard time um, shifting between consuming and creating. Um, there is a startup called Beeminder, which I really like. Uh, you can put, uh, basically, uh, you can say, I don't want to do this. Um, and if you do it, it takes money out of your bank account. <laughs> Which is great. The name is perfect. It's a bee minder. It stings you when and it reminds you that you didn't do the thing. Um, but when I grew up with technology, my dad would have me solder together computer components, or make model rockets, or program some of the stuff, um, or use it to create. And that was awesome. The amount of power that you have as a kid, when everybody makes fun of you all the time and you have no control over your reality, but yet when you go on a computer, you can do anything. Wow. But the thing is, now it's not. It's, it's, it's not the same, you know? So I, I spent a lot of time on the Wayback Machine, the web archive, because that was the internet that wasn't as distracting. So much amazing content on there from just 10 years ago. Um, and it's just incredible. Um, so I struggle with it. I don't know how to fix it. Um, but if it's structured, you know, a, a lot of kids in Silicon Valley are now going to schools that they don't let you use computers until a certain age. And that has its own drawbacks. I think that if kids learn how to program, early on, that's great, like Doug, Douglas Rushkoff's programmer be programmed, 
But again, they shouldn't be forced to do something they don't naturally want to do. Some people really want to create the fabric that everybody exists on, you know? Some people don't. Some people want to play sports. I, don't, I think that, you know... <laughs> And man, I, I wish I could have played sports as a kid, but I just, I wasn't formatted. My brain was not formatted to play sports. It sucked. Um, so I think, you know, being open-minded and, and letting people do things is, as long as you show them the joy of creating something is great, because that's the most rewarding thing ever. Um, as, as an aside, uh, the best thing to do is make a short project that you get the reward quickly from. I completed this, and it was really simple and then a longer project, a longer project, a longer project, until you're like projects that are years. Like I have five year projects that I have the extreme patience to do over time because the rewards are so great. Um, but I started out with little tiny things. Um, so that way you get the same like dopamine hit, it's just you get a bigger dopamine hit later um, versus just clicking on Facebook all the time. Um, and it feels great. So thank you for your question. Thank you everyone.